and a very, very good afternoon if you're in the UK. And if you're around the world, it could be morning or evening. Very, very welcome to what is our 180th Security Thought Leadership webinar. And the idea of thought leadership is that we critique today a subject uh, um, in order that we get a better insight to get a better type of security tomorrow. And you can see from that slide what's coming up and more of that at the end. Right today, though, we're going to be talking about a subject that's cropped up quite a number of times in the first 179. Whistleblowing. What are the benefits and the dangers for the whistleblower? There is this view that on the one hand, this could be great for the company in generating insights that they wouldn't have got from other sources, helping to manage risks and um, uh, reduce the chances of losses or recover them. But on the other hand, presents all sorts of joys and dangers for the whistleblower. But as usual, we've got some experts to come along today to talk to you about it. In a second, I'll be introducing them and then I'll be inviting them each to make an opening statement. And when we've done that, we'll be coming to you, the audience, to ask questions. So if I can ask you to use your question and answer button at the bottom of your screen um, and uh, uh, um, get your questions in early. And as soon as the uh, um, opening statements are over, will come and uh, uh, address the questions that you've got. We've been getting a lot of questions recently, so do please get them in early and we'll incorporate them into the discussion. Without further ado then, let's go and meet our, uh, uh, our go and meet our panellists. And first of all, down in South Africa, let's go and meet Wayne. Wayne, please introduce yourself. Hi, good day. Um, thanks a lot, Martin, and to your, your viewers. Uh, nice to be with you. And uh, uh, I'm Wayne Duvenage. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of a non-profit uh, civil activist group in South Africa called ARTA, which stands for the organization Undoing Tax Abuse. And um, essentially we tackle uh, people in positions of power in government uh, who are involved in corruption or maladministration. And we don't just expose it, we go all the way, we lay criminal charges. We have them declared as delinquent directors if they are on the boards of directors and so forth. So we're in action-based organization funded 100% by the public. Very, very interesting. And thank you very much indeed for joining us. And uh, now actually, based uh, actually in Oslo today, let's go and meet David. David, please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm David Lewis. I'm Professor of Employment Law at Middlesex University in the UK. I'm also convener of the International Whistleblowing Research Network. I've been researching and writing on whistleblowing since 1993. Uh, I've done quite a lot um, of consultancy in the UK. Um, particularly important to me is the work in the NHS for um, the Freedom to Speak Up review um, chaired by um, Sir Robert Francis. Uh, outside the UK, I've had the privilege to work for the UNODC, uh, Council of Europe, uh, European Commission, um, and um, that, that, that's enough. Um, so I, 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 I uh, well, that's it. That's it. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, both of all. As you could tell, we've got um, expertise galore here. Let's hear what they've got to say. Their opening statements, they get three minutes to say what they want to say about this topic. Wayne, over to you. Well, um, thanks. Uh, so from a, from a whistleblower's perspective, um, the pros are really, as far as I can see, uh, reporting, it's a, it's a conscious decision uh, uh, to report what is going wrong in the hope that they are doing the right thing and saving the organization money but uh, or, or whatever it is that is going down. But there are far more cons from a whistleblower's point of view. We've seen, uh, we engage with whistleblowers on a regular basis and, um, and it's tough here in South Africa. The protection isn't too high. We've got a, a Whistleblowers Protection Act uh, and, and uh, or Public Disclosures Act uh, but it doesn't do enough to to really uh, protect whistleblowers, and and generally speaking, they end up uh, being ostracised, being pushed out of their workplace. I'm talking more in the government space, but it's the same thing in the corporate world. Um, they uh, they lose their their uh, jobs, uh, they lose their security, and uh, and they get uh, shunned uh, largely. And and so the cons outweigh from whistleblowers perspective there are no benefits from a from a rewards point of view there are no incentives uh, and so recently you know having conversations with whistleblowers in South Africa we we see that after the fact their their responses if I'd have known what I was going to go through 
uh, at the time, I wouldn't have blown the whistle. And this is becoming more and more a big issue. And and we struggle now to get people to come forward. So, uh, yeah, that's, um, but we need them. We need whistleblowers because we need to get to the bottom and get the actual information of what's going down. So we have to put in place protection mechanisms, anonymity um, uh, platforms for whistleblowers to engage with us. Uh, but long and short of it, uh, Martin, is that uh, unfortunately we don't do enough to protect and support and it's mental support, it's security support or whistleblowers in South Africa get assassinated, especially in government with big contracts that are going down. Uh, they get taken out. Babita Diokaram is, is one, but there are many others. Uh, and she was uh, in the news recently uh, in the last year or so. So it's 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 really a tough time. And, and it's sad that it is this way. And, and what, it, what makes it worse for us and for whistleblowers, these are champions of democracy, champions of what is right. And yet we don't see them being snapped up by, by business. Those are the people that we're sending business here are 10 unemployed people, highly trained, highly skilled in the accounting world, forensics world, employ them because they're the type of people you want in your company to expose corruption. And the business leaders look away and they say, well, you know, we're not sure whether we want people like that. But I would be saying to directors of companies, why not? These are the people that you want to help you overcome the problems uh, that you have in your organization. That's my opening statement. Absolutely fascinating, Wayne. Thank you very much indeed, and so much to come back to. Just remind the audience, if you'd like to get your questions in, um, um, as soon as you can, we'll incorporate them in the discussion that takes place after we've heard from David. David, your opening statement, please. Uh, thank you, Martin. Yes, I want to start off by uh, reminding people about global research, since I am a researcher. Global research shows that one of the two main reasons for people not reporting perceived wrongdoing is the belief that what they uh, the situation will not be rectified. They fear retaliation, but they think, well, there's no point in running that risk because the wrongdoing won't be rectified. Uh, so I believe the issue in 2023 is not how to explain the benefits of whistleblowing. I think we know the benefits of whistleblowing. To, um, to corporations, and the EU knows very well because it introduced a directive. Uh, the the uh, issue in 2023 is how to ensure that those who, uh, the recipients of information about wrongdoing act upon it. Um, so the focus is not encouraging the supplying, but encouraging people to respond appropriately. Hence, the EU directive says uh, whistleblowing procedures should be mandatory. And I believe that is the case. Uh, and the UK, of course, is a, a very good example of poor practice here. Whistleblowing procedures are not mandatory as a matter of law. Uh, there's no duty, statutory duty on employers to investigate concerns or to rectify proven wrongdoing. Quite a shocking situation, and sadly, as Wayne knows, uh, much copied in South Africa. Um, so I, I want to move on to retaliation. Uh, the benefits of whistleblowing, I think, to society, to business, and maybe to the individual who is a moral person wanting to do the right thing. Uh, the, the downsides, the danger to whistleblowers, uh, the, the, that is retaliation. But I'm one of these people who stands up in conferences and says, but hold on, whistleblowing is not defined by retaliation. Global research here shows that 14 up to 20 percent of people suffer retaliation depending on the industry and the country. That means lots of whistleblowers don't suffer retaliation. But those that do are the ones that get the attention in the media. How many times do you see in the press instances of successful whistleblowing? You don't because nobody has got an interest in reporting successful whistleblowing. So uh, I'm very concerned about retaliation. Retaliation can be deterred by employers having good policies, communicating those policies, training people in the policies. Employers should be conducting risk, risk assessments uh, when individuals report wrongdoing. Some countries provide for that. And staff uh, uh, throughout the organization should be exposed to discipline if they engage in retaliation, not just legal remedies, uh, but uh, th there should be uh, discipline. And that's the normal way of dealing with misconduct and retaliation against whistleblowers is misconduct. I also take the view, um, and it's not popular, uh, that retaliation against the whistleblower should be regarded as a criminal offence. Uh, the organisation should uh, face responsibility for that. Uh, and I think if we start to see directors going to prison, uh, we might uh, see some progress here. At the moment, it's too easy for organisations to throw money at the problem. If it comes to civil damages, again, there seems to be no punitive element in the UK. 
You pay compensation. You do not get punished. Um, uh, lastly, I, I'd like to refer to um, the key issues of confidentiality and anonymity. It is patently obvious that the identity of the reporter should be concealed so far as possible. It's not always possible. And maybe the rights of the alleged wrongdoer should also be respected. But anonymous reports are not desirable, but as a last resort, they are vital. If people won't come forward in any other way, we have to provide for anonymous reporting. And lastly, I'm going to appeal to research again and remind people that there is no evidence of widespread um, abuse of, of, of whistleblowing procedures. People rarely knowingly falsely report. It isn't a problem. Uh, so uh, it can be dealt with through the normal channels. It's a serious disciplinary man manner. But this fear of knowingly false reporting is put out very frequently, but there's no evidence that it occurs. It's widespread. People know the consequences of telling lies at work. Martin, that's my opening statement. Really fascinating. Goodness me. Absolutely fascinating. I mean, not least, be, and all the questions are coming in. We better get to the questions, you two, because they're coming in thick and fast. Wait, I wonder when I can ask you a question from Gordon Knight, because it seems to be quite a big deal, but I, I don't know what, what the question's about. So could you interpret this for me? So the question goes, what can be done to protect the person who lifted the lid on the tourism Spurs debar debacle? Um, what's all that about? Because that, is that, is that mm. a quite, quite a big issue, uh, Wayne? Yeah, yeah. It, um, Very briefly, was the uh, government here, our tourism department, was on the brink of signing a, a 1 billion rand uh, or 910 million rand a deal, three year marketing deal with Tottenham Hotspurs, much like the visit Rwanda on the sleeves of Arsenal was going to be with Tottenham. And uh, there was some disagreement with the board members about this. You know, we believe as a country that is broken, got big issues to deal with, that. Um, that, that this money could be better spent uh, and possibly not to say take it away from tourism marketing and put it elsewhere. We've got to market this country, get more visitors here, but um, but it could be better done. You, you, you know, we've got, to, we've got to spend money in other markets. Uh, we're a well-known market to Europe. We've got to spend money in markets like China and India, Asia, get new tourists and new markets developed. So there was this difference, a uh, difference of opinion, and somewhere along the line, this deal before it was leaked was was uh, well before the decision was made, it was leaked to the media, and it became a public furor, uh, and rightly so because uh, the the business tourism business council wasn't consulted. There's a you know you need to get the players, the industry on board, uh, and and instead of tackling the issue, which is what needs to be tackled. Um, the uh, people inside the tourism board are going on a witch hunt to find out who leaked it. Uh, and, and, and this is sad because the focus is in the wrong area. In fact, that individual needs to be praised because essentially what's happened is they have uh, she or he, whoever leaked that, uh, uh, that, that, that plan and the proposal, um, got the right eyes onto it and eventually got parliament to quickly call the uh, parties to, to order and stop the deal. Uh, for the right reasons. And uh, had we not done that, had this person not leaked this uh, potential deal going down, we wouldn't have been the wiser. And you can't undo these deals after they are signed. So our government, unfortunately, and the people inside these government bodies continuously see the wrong side of things. They go after the individual instead of going after the fact that the company or the organization was doing the wrong thing. And this comes back to something you were saying in your opening statement, David. I wonder whether I could just sort of get get a little bit behind this because it's quite a, a quite a damning sort of situation where the perception somewhat is different to the reality of what's going on. Now, of course, the immediate answer is well, we need more public education. But what's the process of rectifying that? Because it seems to me, from what you said, faith in the system is undermined by a false perception of some of the issues about it. Is that right? And where's the yes, remedy there? I, I think that's right. And I can just comment on what, what, what Wayne said. Whistleblowing is about the message. It's not the messenger. That's what's important to us. It, it's what's being said. So which I'm getting the message is a complete diversion. I agree with Wayne. Uh, you, you asked me a question. I'll answer that question. Uh, the, 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 there is a misunderstanding. I mean, there's a there's a theory that you're not a whistleblower unless you've suffered retaliation. We have not investigated as a researcher's successful whistleblowing where somebody's raised a concern. It's been important. It's been dealt with. The individual's been thanked, was, uh, uh, thanked, had been promoted, and uh, 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 etc. 
So uh, we're not made aware, too aware of successful stories because it's not newsworthy and no party has got an interest. Why would a bank that's had suffered successful, sorry, experienced successful whistleblowing expose the fact that there's what wrongdoing that was rectified? Why would the, the messenger have an interest in doing so? It's very difficult to research that. So uh, we don't know too much about that. So there are, there are uh, uh, perceptions. One of the things that does bother me about public education, we don't educate people in employment rights. We don't uh, tell people about freedom of speech in civics in school. We don't uh, build on that. We talked about bullying harassment in school, but people are not receiving uh, when they grow up, they're not getting the kind of uh, uh, notion. This is part of democracy. Speaking up about wrongdoing is your duty in society. It may be a professional duty when you go up. Also, a great thing in the UK, um, and I can't really speak for other countries here, I don't want to condemn other countries, that we have got whistleblowing legislation in the UK since 1998. Uh, the evidence is that even in uh, 2020, uh, that a bare majority of people have even heard of the legislation, never mind been educated or trained in it. So government does not promote this. Um, uh, you can you, you can you imagine why it doesn't do that. But the, the, the truth is that the employers can still go around witch hunting messengers uh, and not focusing on, on, on the message. Uh, and people still think, well, there's a danger of knowingly false reporting. There is no evidence of that. Uh, the, the, the education, uh, education uh, should be about um, uh, what, what is necessary in, in a society. What, what should people do in the public interest? And whistleblowing is very much about the public interest. It's not about the motives of the messenger. And often we focus on the motives of the messenger. Nobody cares about the motives of the messenger. If the messenger is telling the truth that the roof, roof is going to blow off a stadium it doesn't matter why they're reporting if that information is true okay wayne let me just come to you on this because um this point about celebrating successful whistleblowing it sounds a little bit of a no-brainer yeah. why is that difficult in, in your context is there anything in addition you'd want to say to what uh, david said about this no, I, I, I think we should be doing a lot more. And in fact, civil society plays the role and the media here plays the role in celebrating whistleblowers and celebrating the uh, the good information that, that comes uh, and helping the country to stave off losses that uh, or the company that, uh, that result from, 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 from uh, the action that they've taken. But sadly, the company doesn't celebrate them enough in an overt manner. Um, they deal with it, if it's a company normally, and then the government department deal with it in a, in a manner of embarrassment, in a manner of, and I mean, on this on this Tottenham Hotspur deal, uh, the, the CEO of the SA Tourism in the press conference, who was trying to explain why it was a good idea, uh, said in the response, and we need to find out who leaked this, um, this information and isolate them. Now, when you use words like isolate and, and get hold of them and teach them a lesson, then this is just diabolical. So, so uh, that when, when, as we said, they need to be celebrated. So while civil society is doing the celebration and the media are thanking them, uh, the, the, the people who the individual is, is, is saving money for just don't seem to understand this need to celebrate the, the whistleblower and praise them within the organization. And uh, and as David says, you know, make the rules within the organization one that that really lifts them up and deals with them in a positive manner. Uh, there isn't enough celebration of whistleblowers, unfortunately. OK, I'm going to move on, chaps, because we've got a lot of questions coming. In. I want to cover a few more territories. Um, David, David Gill has got asked a question. Surely there's a duty of care for members of staff, isn't there? Whether well, there is a duty of care for members of staff. Um, why is it, doesn't that automatically extend to people who whistleblow? Yes. Yes, it does. The, the, the common law, um, yeah, employers would have a duty of care, health and safety, whatever. Make sure somebody's not victimised and whatever. That's absolutely right. But the duty of care is to take such steps as are reasonably practicable. What we want here, people are, are, are going to, unless people have got a legal duty to disclose, and most people don't, uh, they're going to err on the side of caution. They've heard of victimisation and whistleblowers. I don't have an obligation. Uh, I have an obligation to report terrorism and money laundering. I don't have a, an 
obligation um, to generally uh, report uh, bad teaching in, in a mind institution. Well, I, 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 and so um, uh, people are, are going to say, well, look, I'm protected by the duty of care. I don't know how far that goes. If they've got a whistleblowing uh, procedure that specifically safeguards them, that would be more uh, reassuring. And if, if, in fact, employers who don't carry out risk assessments uh, are, are, are in a whistleblowing situation are, are exposed to fines and some other punishment, you have something more tangible. So the duty of care is fine, but it's very broad and, and it doesn't deal with the particular problem that most people have a choice. They don't have to blow the whistle. Some people do in certain situations, but if people have got a choice about blowing the whistle, my advice to them is you don't blow the whistle unless you've told your family, you know the, the consequences to you. So that is very sad in 2023 when we're talking about speaking up in the public interest. Well, interesting you to say that because uh, let me come to you, Wayne, because Simon Chan has asked a question about when people say they're acting in good faith, um, of course, and with the right intentions, uh, um, does it give them a right to speak out if they believe it to be true? Isn't part of the process to be what have you done internally first? I mean, is there a is there, Wayne, an expectation when you're doing this that before they speak out, they will have tried other channels or is that not necessary? Wayne? No, very necessary. It, it is. I think they need to, as David says, um, just unpack what's what's at stake here. What are the consequences um, and uh, get the facts uh, understand your organization's uh, policies on this. Uh, follow the rules very carefully, um, and 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 be sure that you 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 know that the whistleblowing uh, process is a safe one, is a secure one. Try and remain as anonymous as possible if it allows you to, um, and then see where it goes from there. But uh, yeah, you don't have. You know, you just got to be very careful. You might think and feel you have something here um, and, and it might not be. And you might be getting into a space that is uh, th th that's going to get you into more trouble because you're, you, you're, you're possibly exposing something that isn't uh, an issue. So just be sure about it. Get the facts uh, and make notes about it. And if you can, speak to somebody in the outside, speak to somebody not related to your organization to say, look, I have the situation and what do you think I need to do or, or how should I, I deal with this? And you might get some good guidance there. There are whistleblowing uh, organizations out there that give you a lot of advice in this space. Um, we've often seen uh, people coming into the whistleblowing space, but in actual fact, they came very late. They were on the wrong side of the issue and realized, whoops, uh, I now can see that the ship is steering against this group uh, within the organization. I better cross the floor and whistleblow. Well, you know, in hindsight, you should have done that a long time ago. So there's those quandaries. And, and now you're in a really difficult space. Look, just be sure of what, what you're doing, because uh, the consequences can be dire to your, to your life and, uh, and to your uh, job and your, and, and your livelihood. Really interesting. I mean, fascinating stuff. This is not it's not as easy as it all seems. Um, uh, Dave, let me come back to you. Um, uh, um, is so so Gary Shields has asked the question. Uh, what are your views on the thoughts on whistleblowing being looked at as an insider threat uh, and managing that as a risk or opportunity alongside other risks? Should it be considered in the same way, David, as other risks in the organisation? David? Oh. I don't see whistleblowing as a, as a threat. I think it's an opportunity to encourage to, the organisation has a policy that says it wants um, to be made aware of, uh, of wrongdoing so that it can rectify it. It wants to be made aware of wrongdoing uh, b b before anybody else does, because if it, if it, if it's not made aware of wrongdoing uh, by those within the organisation reporting internally, it may be made aware of wrongdoing uh, by, 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 from outside. So I don't talk, think of it as an insider threat, it's an insider opportunity to be the first to know about the wrongdoing, to deal with it before it becomes a problem. Let's be very clear here. Whistleblowing primarily, the paradigm is internal reporting. Those who suffer retaliation are more likely to be the ones that went outside. They are vulnerable. Then there's big questions of loyalty. But how can you be disloyal if you raise a concern with your employer in accordance with the employer's procedure? But what, well, the answer would be, David, if but back to the last bit, if they get it wrong, if they're being malicious or if they've been misguided, 
Uh, I'm just saying that that's potentially a risk because the, the consequences could be serious, couldn't they? Yeah, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. Yes, uh, it, I, I'm saying is there's no evidence that people that uh, knowingly make false reports. We have got to allow for the fact that people can get the wrong end of the stick, as Wayne was mentioning before. They, 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 the whistleblowers are the messengers. They're not the investigators, so they may have a reasonable suspicion. They've got to have reasonable grounds. Okay, that's imperative. If in fact uh, the, the threat comes from people who uh, knowingly make false allegations, there's no great evidence of that and they can be jumped on like a ton of bricks so you make it clear that if you make a mistake you won't be punished it's about reasonable suspicion honest behavior if you are dishonest you simply uh, put forward false information you will be treated uh, uh, you'll be you're guilty of very serious misconduct so it's about tone it's about culture if at the top the organization says we want to hear from you we will protect you we are the investigators you report your concerns you err on the side of reporting. If you've got the right culture, you could have open, people can speak openly, they don't need to follow the procedure. So I, I, I reject the notion of insider threat. It, it's an assumption that people are, are, are dishonest, but the, the threat comes, I think, for organisations that don't have procedures. People don't know where to go. They may not take the advice that Wayne's saying they should take. What do they do? They, they, they go outside the organisation because the organisation has not said, we welcome this internal reporting it's very very sad the organization gets into trouble the individual gets into trouble for going outside the organization why didn't they have a procedure it to me it's a no-brainer how does an organization lose by having a whistleblowing procedure uh, okay uh, interesting interesting uh, answer uh, let me move on though because we've got a lot to get through and a lot of questions are coming in um, uh, um, Wayne, well, let me come back to you, please. And Ian, you and Grant's got a question, which is, I think is an interesting one again. Um, are there types of issues that typically are at the forefront of whistleblowing possibilities and issues that are not? Can we divide it up like that? Or is it all, is it all fair game and all fair opportunity? Wayne? Yeah, I, I think uh, the the... The way we would encapsulate what makes a what makes stuff that needs to be reported is is the shareholder um, going to suffer uh, the consequences of whatever it is is going down. So the whistleblower sees a deal, it's corrupt. There's middlemen involved. Prices are inflated. Uh, whatever it is, so is what going down is good for the shareholder or in government's case the public uh, and the taxpayer and if not then that's what you need to uh, unpack get the evidence and get the facts not uh, very often you have the hearsay and the, that's where you don't want to go don't come with whistleblowing on hearsay we have far too much of that and we say well give us the evidence because we can do nothing on hearsay oh well i'm not sure i, I this is what i heard well that's wasting people's time get the facts and if it's wrong uh then that's that, that that's the stuff but what uh you don't want to do and very often people try and blow the whistle on a, a, an issue that's really a grudge it's an axe to grind against the boss who's uh who's as dave says has handled something it's it, you know in a way that they might might not have or shouldn't have um uh, and that's not really whistleblowing. It's not dealing uh, with an issue of fraud and corruption in an organization. It's dealing with a, something that has to be handled through a grievance procedure, raise a grievance, this is wrong, the manager needs to be taken to task or whatever. That's not whistleblowing on the on the space of corruption. Okay, interesting. This next question I'm going to ask to both of you, and I'm going to ask David first, um, because it's been been addressed by two, uh, um, two, two members of the audience. And by the way, I had a question in the same line in advance. Uh, Michael John uh, McNear says, should whistleblowers be given a financial reward on a successful prosecution upon their evidence, David? And uh, similarly, uh, um, Michael Gibbs said, do we incentivize uh, whistleblowing uh, um, programs um, rewarded with compensation? Uh, David first, good or bad idea? 
Re sorry, rewards and compensation are not the same. Compensation is for loss suffered. Reward, yeah, you may not have suffered any loss. So let's be very clear. I think all whistleblowers who suffer loss should be compensated. Uh, th there's a the big moral argument about rewards. Does this taint the motive of the whistleblower? I'm against rewards in principle because whistleblowers do not speak up uh, be because they want a reward. They, they want to speak up because there's wrongdoing they want rectified. That's my experience. If you, you get bounty hunters in the States because... Uh, 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 the, uh, there's no employment protection uh, that's worth having uh, and you've got structured um, reward system in the financial uh, sector. So uh, I do have a problem with a reward system. It isn't the same as compens compensation. Uh, the, the problem I've got with rewards, and I've changed my views on this, I used to be 100% uh, say no, it, it, it's uh, it, it, rewards suggest whistleblowers are, are not doing things for the right reasons. That is a problem. I believe in the financial services sector though there is a case because you can measure what's been lost you can measure the gain to the exchequer in, in in quantitative figures the problem with the rewards for whistleblowing is how, how do you reward uh somebody where what they've reported on has got no no finite no direct financial implications if we want people to speak up about uh, medical malpractice um how are you going to reward a nurse for reporting uh, what they think is bad practice by a doctor how, how are you going to do that? And, and in fact, we know nurses are going to speak up because of the, they've got a duty to do so in the interest of patients. So, so I believe in the financial services sector, if people have got a choice, and they often do, unless it's money laundering, they've got a choice whether to report or not, given the risks that they run or their thoughts are run, perceived to run, but maybe they don't. You may, rewards might be appropriate, but re outside financial services, I'm not sure how rewards work. Let's take the two main areas where we've, we've really develop procedures on whistleblowing financial services and the health services. I can't see how rewards f feature in the health service in the same way. Yeah, interesting. Wayne, your thoughts on this? I mean, um, should we incentivize or stroke reward um, whistleblowers? No, I, I agree with Dave here. Yeah, uh, exactly. I think whistleblowing comes from the authentic space of uh, we've got to discuss this. I've got to get it out there. Uh, and, and the authorities need to know about this to stop it from happening. Uh, it's not about um, saying, well, he, there's, there should never be a carrot approach. Well, if you whistleblow, we're going to give you this reward. Because then you do have people going into uh, blowing the whistle for the wrong reasons. Uh, if, if it's going to be an incentive, yeah, I'm, I'm, I agree with David 100%. I mean, um, I guess the, the, the point is, though, that um, uh, would you agree with it in, in the financial sector? I mean, David raised the point there. There you can measure the success. You've got a two-tier system. It wouldn't work in the public sector, maybe, but it might work in the financial sector. Can you see the logic of that? Or is it to you, Wayne, simply that it promotes the wrong sort of reason? No, I think you can. I think it makes a bit more sense in that space. But again, uh, one needs to be very careful how you structure that. Um, and it needs to be authentic uh and 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 not for the the sake of making money but yes sometimes an incentive in that space where it is very clear cut uh, and it is tackling things like money laundering which is a big problem uh and in the banking sector movement of funds and finances uh, it, it is probably a place for it but you have to be it has to be very carefully defined yeah okay um, I'm going to come back to you, David, and uh, something you raised earlier, and Wilson Kamau, I hope Wilson, I pronounced that uh, properly, apologise if I haven't. Um, it's about the process for how you inculcate a culture of whistleblowing, of acceptability. You mentioned, I think, in your opening statement, uh, David, about leadership from the top mm. um, and about this being an important part. Um, is that what it's about, ultimately, leadership from the top, setting the example and uh, having a good strategy? Absolutely. Uh, you, you, we had the um, references made before about hunting out uh, people at the top wanting to hunt out the messenger. Uh, I'm going to remind people about Jess Daly, who was running Barclays. Uh, Jess Daly wanted to go. He, he was actually debarred. He had to pay a fine. Um, so uh, the tone at the top is, is vital. That is just 
how not to do it. I was actually advising Barclays many, many years ago about procedures and whatever. And what happens after Jess Daly does that? The culture is gone, whispering policies and procedures simply not believed. Now, I, I believe the culture at the top is vital. You start off with having a policy, the, the, the policy you have to, uh, you know, you have to walk the talk. So uh, the, the, you have to have a policy at the top that says that we want you to speak up. The, the, this has to be promoted. Individuals can be incentivized. They can be recognized. They can be acknowledged within the organization. They could have some kind of uh, not uh, not reward, but the, 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 there are ways of actually rewarding people other than financially so that you can have um, employee of the year, etc. But I, I think this is coming from, it's not just me, I'm not an expert in this area. Everybody says good practice requires uh, things to come from the top. So you have a policy, you consult trade unions and employee reps about that policy, but the organisation has to own it, it has to promote it, it has to live it, and it has to demonstrate that it's working. Then you get a culture. Ideally, you want people to be free to speak up, but you've got to have uh, safeguards. And then secondly, uh, it, I believe that uh, this is the proper way to conduct industrial relations, that you have a policy and you have a procedure that enables that policy to be implemented, and you consult with the staff about that procedures. If you can, you agree the procedure with the trade union. Look at the health service in the UK, they have a procedure after full consultation so that the organisation is not just promoting the culture, but the trade union is promoting that culture as well. If, if whistleblowing is worth anything in the public interest, it has to be in the interest of trade unions and employers uh, to, to promote private interests. I'm one of these people who believes that whistleblowing in, it, it, there's whistleblowing in the public interest, but for organisations they're entitled to say, we want, people, we want uh, whistleblowing in the private interest. It's in the interest of of our shareholders and our stakeholders as well. So this culture is important. There are ways of doing it. It's not rocket science. There's international good practice. There's a, a very new ISO standard of, about management behavior. So uh, I'm not an expert on workplace culture, but I do believe that if you're going to be taken seriously, it's the top of the organization that has to buy in. And once it undermines that, once, once there is a feeling that the organization doesn't really want to promote whistleblowing and the culture of speaking up, then you in trouble. I can't give a, a, a clearer example of Barclays. Total ruination. Jess Daly's uh, behaviour totally ruined everything that HR were trying to do in terms of promoting whistleblowing policies and procedures. Yeah, interesting. And, and Wayne, just uh, uh, on this, um, I guess, is it the case, Wayne, that if it's a well-run organisation, you're less likely to get whistleblowing? Anyway, one, because there'll be less problem, and two, because... <laughs> People will deal with it in uh, internally because they've got faith in it. So the better run is. Would that be a fair statement, Wayne? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, as Dave says, if your policies are very clear, if your staff and people that sign on uh, are made very clear in the codes of conduct, that uh, this is our whistleblower policy, this is our ethics uh, policy, this is how we deal with difficult situations that you will find yourself in from time to time. Uh, if all of that is made clear and onboarding people, they, they can see that. And then um, it is demonstrated from the top in the one or two instances where, where a whistleblower uh, might need to come forward and expose it, that that person is, is, is held up as a, as a good example of what good employees are. Uh, but I think if you, if you uh, I mean, then, then, you're, then the rest of the organization will take that organization seriously, it's leadership. So it does start from the top. You just got to permeate this culture of we welcome whistleblowing, authentic whistleblowing. Uh, if it's an issue, we will deal with it. And then you, you, you do, the, 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 the company and the organization has less chance of people trying to take shortcuts because there are a lot of eyes and a lot of ears and a lot of administrators and PAs that see what's going down. And if they can feel safe, uh, I think you'll you'll stamp out any uh, need for whistleblowing uh, in your organization. So, but you've got to always have it there. You've got to have a very robust procedure in case it's it's required. Comes from the top, and ethics is what it's all about. And if you have these regular discussions in the workplace uh, and in programs that run and make people feel safe. Uh, I, I, I think you'll run a, a, an organ, honest organization that, that's probably never going to have to need to deal with whistleblowers uh, because they know that the threat is there, uh, the people it, doing the wrong thing. 
Yeah, that, I can't tell you how many times that's cropped up on the first 179 webinar about, about a world <laughs> organization. Let me just come to you, David, very quickly, if I might, because we're running out of time. It's from an anonymous attendee. And the reason I'm coming to you, it's slightly pitched on something you said. Um, um, and the anonymous uh, attendee says, you only have to look at how the NHS mistreated whistleblowers a few years ago. They have speak up guardian system in place now, but staff are still very resistant to support wrongdoings because lost good staff lost their jobs as a result. This uh, attendee was one of them uh, and argues the need for a completely independent body to oversee and to, re to respond to reports made by whistleblowers. David, realistic? Could that be done? Is that a possibility? Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, I am aware the health services have made big efforts, uh, but there's, there's still a culture of fear uh, uh, in some places. It's not. David, can I just stop you? NHS National Health Service. Someone just asked me to clarify. Please, sorry, David. Please carry on. I'm awfully sorry. Yeah, uh, fair enough. Um, I, I do think what we've got in the UK, we've got a system of regulators, and a number of regulators are operating for health service employees. We do not have in the UK any oversight agency. We don't have. Uh, uh, um, uh, an oversight agent that's going to direct regulators how to behave to, to produce a code of practice for the public and, and private sector. So um, uh, th th there is an argument, I think, that there should be a specialist oversight agency uh, within the NHS. The National Guardian thing is not taken off in the way that some people thought. It doesn't have resources and whatever. There's an argument there should be a national oversight agency that would, um, uh, would be available to everybody, not just within the health service. So the idea of having proper oversight to make sure that the uh, recipients of concern are doing the right thing uh, is vitally important. I don't think there's any argument against it. Uh, I do know in the UK, whenever you mention a national whistleblowing agency, uh, you get, oh, that's a good idea in principle. How much does it cost? And the answer is enormous. And uh, the government, and I, can, I, and I can say this with great confidence, that the government has not done anything uh, um, substantively uh, with the existing legislation. It's been put under a lot of pressure to do things uh, and uh, it hasn't done them and I'm afraid one of the arguments is the cost argument we, we can see uh, we can see the value of a national oversight agency we can also see the enormous cost of it there is sign at the moment of course with the proceeds of crime uh, that maybe the government is more interested in whistleblowing. Uh, but if it comes to injecting massive resources uh, a national oversight agency I think is unlikely desirable oh, yeah. unlikely and, uh, and interesting, uh, just because we got, I, I want to go more than one example, UK, uh, Wayne, um, uh, South Africa, agency there of any description like this? And would it go down well? Does it need it? It is very much needed. Uh, the president has been very long in the making, just appointed uh, recently the, uh, uh, the National Anti-Corruption Advisory Council. Uh, and its members are going to now set up procedures around six pillars of how we tackle corruption and and, uh, and whistleblowing and the number of uh, the factors in the space. And I think David's right. Uh, it, it It's very expensive. You need to protect whistleblowers because when they're ostracized, their lives are at threat. Uh, there's counseling. Uh, they need funds to just pay their bonds and keep their kids in school. We need a lot of this to still take place in this country. It's very necessary, uh, but government needs to support it and do so diligently and authentically. David and Wayne, we could go on. The questions have been numerous, a fascinating insight into the issues. Uh, once again, uh, um, I think we've all learned a lot and uh, very grateful to you both. And the debate will go on. So uh, thank you very much. Just a few final comments from me, if I might. Uh, um, just to let you know that uh, the Indian Ospers, the uh, um, entries close on the 20th of February. On the 27th of February, the Ireland Ospers close and South Africa, they just opened. So in South Africa, get those entries into the Outstanding Security Performance Awards. Talk about highlighting good practice. This is the place to do it. Uh, also to let you know that up and coming events, we've got the UK Ospers and Thought Leadership Summit on the 23rd of February, followed by the Indian Ospers followed by New Zealand, followed by Ireland. If you're in those countries, do not miss those events. That's where we look at who's doing things well, who's doing things outstandingly well, in fact. We're going on the road here. We're going out to meet you. We're going to be at the security event in Birmingham on the 25th to 27th of April. Do come along and do come and say hello to us. And also to say we're going to be back again. 
uh, the UK Security Thought Leadership Summit. That is near your sellout, by the way. So um, that's on the afternoon before the Ospers. We're doing it in association with the National Security Inspectorate. We've got a former terrorist coming to speak to us about his radicalization. We've got a panel discussion about procurement. We've got a session on what the bosses say, two managing directors talking about the state of security and where it's going. If you're in the UK, you didn't miss that, the afternoon before the Ospers. And uh, on the 16th of March, food protection, food security. That is a big, big deal. We're very grateful to the ASIS Food Defence and Agricultural Security Community are working with us on that one. And at the end of next month, falling victim to fraudsters. This is a massive issue. Fraud has gone up exponentially. Uh, um, so we're going to be looking at the victimization process. How do you stop it and what to do if you're victimized? So look out for those. We're going to be out and about as well. Thank you very much indeed to Wayne and David today. Thank you, the audience, for questions. Uh, and as I always say on these webinars, uh, finally, uh, wherever you are in the world, stay safe until we meet again. Take care.